Okay, welcome back. Um, so today we're going to continue our discussion of uh, scalar field theory and we're going to discuss in more detail how we approach the, the continuum limit. So how we go, you know, sort of away from the lattice model and towards uh, continuum physics. So before we do that, are there any urgent questions about what we discussed yesterday? No, okay, good. So if you have any non-urgent questions, we can discuss, uh, we can discuss offline, of course. Just, <clears throat> just let me make a, a couple of comments about what we did uh, today. Um, after the, the lecture, some, some of you asked uh, a very good question about the, the volume of the system. They should have asked, actually, during the, the lecture, it would have been useful for, for everybody. So I said at the beginning we were working in a finite volume T times V or L to the power V and that eventually we would be interested in sending L to infinity. Everything we discussed about, so if you're in a, if you're in a finite box, you have to specify boundary conditions, okay? You have to tell what you're doing at the boundary. Everything we discussed about the free field, we discussed in the infinite volume, in the infinite volume case, okay? So when you are in the infinite volume case, momenta are continuous and lie in the Brillouin zone, when you are in a finite volume, you have to specify periodic boundary conditions. And then, depending on the periodic boundary conditions, you get a quantization condition for momenta. Okay? So instead of having, it, instead of having an integral, here you have an integral over dp over 2 pi. When you are in a finite volume, you get a sum over quantized values of p, okay? Does that make sense? Okay, very good. And <clears throat> another quick uh, comment while following on from what we did yesterday. So yesterday we computed the partition function for the free theory. Okay, we saw that this is just a Gaussian integral. which can be performed by just a shift of variables, basically by completing the, the square, <coughs> and gives you this exact result where this delta is the inverse of the kernel of the free action. Okay? So that's the, that's the propagator. Then, of course, as soon as you have the partition function for the free theory, you can compute the partition function for the, for the interacting theory just by acting with functional derivatives. Okay, this is the usual way of setting up perturbation theory, right? You expand this exponential in a Taylor series acting on the free partition function and the, that gives you perturbation theory, okay? So in principle, there is nothing that stops you to setting up perturbation theory on the lattice. It's exactly the same as in the continuum theory except that the propagator is given by this awkward function with signs of sine squared of AP over 2, okay? So we're not going to explore lattice perturbation theory, uh, but, it's, uh, but, it's, uh, but it can be done, and it can be done exactly in the same way as you do it for a theory in continuum space-time, okay? So <coughs> having said that, let's try to discuss the approach to the continuum limit. From a, 
renormalization group sort of um, point of view. So remember what we said yesterday, we define our theory on a space-time lattice, so we introduce the uh, a natural cutoff, okay, which in momentum space is given by the inverse of the of the lattice spacing, okay, so this is an ultraviolet cutoff. So we have a path integral which is a well-defined function <laughs> of, the param of, the of the parameters that appear in the action. And, uh, and I'm going to call these parameters bare parameters. Okay? So in principle, you know, you can put uh, as many couplings as you like in your, in your action, as long as they're compatible with the symmetries of your theory. So we're going to enlarge like the space of theories, and we're going to consider generic actions that depend on a set of coupling G with an index alpha that just labels the different couplings. Okay, now the hat here means that these couplings are dimensionless, okay? So if you have a dimensionful coupling, you scale it by powers of A. Okay. So <coughs> I'm going to give you an explicit uh, example in a, in a moment. So you, know, you have a cutoff A, you specify a set of bare parameters, and then this is just a multidimensional integral that you can compute. It's perfectly well defined beyond sort of perturbation theory. Okay? So in particular, you can compute uh, physical quantities okay. the generic quantities which I'm going to call capital F or curly F and these are going to be a function of the couplings times mu A where mu is any typical scale that enters into the definition of your physical quantity. So it could be the external momenta of some, uh, of some process, for instance, okay? So this is the, if you like, this is the, the scale of your, of your physical process. This is the cutoff that you have introduced by discretizing the theory, and these are your bare couplings, okay? Now, the fundamental idea of the renormalization of the renormalization group is that the details of the theory at the ultraviolet scale uh, do, do not change the physics at low energies, okay? So what do I mean precisely by, by that? What I mean is that If I have a physical observable and I change sorry, and I change the value of A, I can compensate this change by a change in the couplings at the scale of the cutoff, so the couplings that appear in the bare action such that the physical quantities are unaffected, okay? And this is true up to corrections that are in way to some power in general, okay? So if you are at low energies, so if mu A is a small number, the physical observables, if you change the cutoff, you can keep the physical observables unchanged provided you retune your couplings. 
Okay? So the idea is that you have a high energy scale, <coughs> A minus one. This is the scale where you define all your bare couplings. Okay? Once this is given, you can compute anything at lower scales. Okay. And the idea is that the physics down here is pretty much independent of the value of A, provided you are willing to retune your couplings. Okay? And change the normalization of your fields. Does that make sense? Okay, good. So we are going to try to explore the, the consequences of this uh, statement. So first of all, you see, in order to, in order to make the low energy physics independent of the details of the theory at the cutoff, I've made the couplings a function of the lattice spacing, okay? So now, Really, we can think of uh, these couplings that are functions of A as a flow in a space of parameters. Or if you prefer, in the space of theories. Okay. So, what is this space of theories? Well, as I said a moment ago, it's the space of all possible couplings that are compatible with the symmetries of your system. Okay? So in this case, with the symmetries of the lattice, of the lattice theory. So we can write the action here. as the usual kinetic term plus and now here we have the sum over all possible couplings that are compatible with the symmetries of the system. Okay, and this is what I mean by scaling out the dimensions of the coupling, okay? The alpha is the mass dimension of the operator O. Okay? So this has got mass dimension d alpha. This is A to the d alpha minus D. So A to the d alpha times O is dimension less. Remember, there is a factor of a to the d hidden here in the sum of x. Okay? So this factor of a to the d cancels with this factor of a to the minus d. And so the g hats are dimension less. Okay? And <clears throat> again, in principle, okay, this sum here spans over all the possible operators that you can write that are compatible with the symmetries of the system. So in this case, that are hypercubic invariant and even in the number of fields. Okay? Remember the Z2 symmetry, phi going, to minus, going into minus phi would forbid uh, odd operators. Okay. So now, this idea here that the physics is uh, invariant can be made a little bit more sort of precise, okay? And can be, remember all the, as we said yesterday, I mean all the physical quantities can actually be extracted from correlators, okay? So this statement about the low energy physics being invariant can actually be translated into a statement about correlators, okay? And the statement about correlators is that the, 
renormalized correlators. This is the renormalization of the fields that I was briefly mentioning uh, a moment ago. Okay. So, provided you renormalize your fields by this factor z, this is not the partition function now, okay? it's the renormalization of the field. You have to allow for polymorphism. I mean, you know, these are sort of historical notations. The renormalization of the fields is always called Z. The partition function is always called Z. And so it's, I mean, it's the same symbol for two different things. Okay? So here is the renormalization of the, of the fields. So provided you renormalize the, the fields, all the correlators computed at G alpha and A are equal to the correlators computed at G prime alpha. A prime. Okay? Is everybody happy so far? I mean, happiness here is meant in a very technical way, in the sense that <laughs> you, you, you understand what's going on. Okay, so personal happiness, I'm not trained. <laughs> okay? Still, still with me? Yeah? Okay, very good. So then we can um, re express this. But just by saying that the derivative, you know, in a differential, so out of this we can get a differential equation, you know, just by saying that the derivative with respect to A of this product is equal to zero, okay? These two are exactly the same statement, and um, this is the differential version of the statement uh, above. And so here you see there is a dependence. The dependence on A comes from the renormalization of the fields. There is an explicit dependence on A because there is a cutoff in my action, and then all the couplings are A dependent. Okay? So when we take this total derivative, well, we have to take the derivative using the chain rule, and we're going to get several, several terms. <clears throat> so let me, let me um, write out some of the steps. Okay? So first of all, we're going to have a contribution from the derivative acting on this term here, okay? which I'm going to write as minus sign over 2. 1 over z, a d by dA of z, <coughs> and then z to the minus n over 2 of a times phi. And then we're going to add a contribution from the total derivative acting on, on this part. Let me see if I can skip a few. No, let's, let's, do, let's do it in, in detail. There is no point in making it messy. Okay, and then we're going to get... So, so far, I've just taken the derivative here, acting on this term first, and then on that term. Okay? Now, this quantity here, I'm going to call uh, gamma phi. It's going to be called uh, the anomalous dimension of the field. Okay? So, one half. Okay. 
end, when we take the derivative here, acting on phi, on the sorry, on the correlator, we have to remember that there is an a dependence, there is an explicit a dependence, and there is a an a dependence in the couplings. Okay, so a d d e a d by d a acting on this, we can rewrite. in the following form. There's going to be an, expli an explicit dependence on A, and then just the chain rule. It's not a physical observable, but all the observables can be extracted from the correlators. Yeah. Okay? So if the correlators stay invariant, then you're guaranteed that all the physics is going to be invariant, okay? because the physics you extract from, the physical quantities you extract from the correlators. Okay, okay so now here I'm going to introduce beta functions, so I'm going to call the derivative of A, of G, sorry, with respect to A, beta, so for every coupling there is a beta function, and in principle the beta function is a function of all the couplings in the theory, okay, each beta function is a function of all the couplings in the theory, and here I've put a minus because this is the log derivative with respect to something which is a length scale, okay? So usually the beta function is defined by taking the derivative with respect to a, an energy scale when you work in momentum, when you have a, a cutoff in momentum space and there is no minus, okay? So the minus here is just because I'm taking derivatives with respect to uh, space. Okay. So, using this definition of the beta function and this definition here of the anomalous dimension, we recover the renormalization group equation for the correlators. set of equations describe the renormalization group flow of the theory. Okay? So this is a set of coupled differential equations that tell you <coughs> how the bare parameters have to change as you change the cutoff scale in order to keep the physics, the low energy physics invariant. And this equation here is, a, is one of the many incarnations of the kallen simansic equation, and that tells you how the correlators behave as you change the scale. Okay? Yes? Uh, why do you write the beta, the beta function, the function of G uh, hat, but not of the scale of A? Okay, that's...
That's a very good question. Um, the the Try to give you a good a good answer to that. Let me let, let me think about that. I'll give you I'll give you an answer because I, I want to give you a proper answer to that. The, um, you see, the only dependence here could be on mu on mu a, right? Because of dimensional reasons. I mean, these are all dimensionless couplings. So the only thing that could up, that could appear here is mu a. Uh, but let me think. But let me think about that uh, properly. We'll come to that. There is only a finite number of parameters that you're interested in eventually in, uh, in this game, and we'll see that in a, in a second. You can set up many different schemes. Okay? You can set up many different renormalization schemes. Okay? So that's perfectly fine, where you will have different flows. Okay? You can reparameterize couplings. We will come to that. I'll, I'll comment on that uh, in a second. Okay? Um, let me, st let me stress something here. Um, there are no divergences in, in what I'm writing at the moment, right? Because we're always talking of a theory where the cutoff is in place, okay? Here you always have a finite A, okay? And so all these quantities are finite, okay? And I'm just changing the cutoff. I'm not removing the cutoff. Eventually, if I send the cutoff to infinity, I would get divergences, sorry, to zero in this case, I would get divergences. But here, I'm always working with finite quantities, okay? Right, so here we are. We have a flow in, uh, in the space of, uh, of couplings, okay? And now, the interesting places, okay, in, uh, parameter space are places where this flow has a fixed point. Okay. So points where all the beta functions vanishes are fixed point of the renormalization group flow. So if you sit at a fixed point and you change the cutoff, nothing changes. Okay? So the theory is basically scale invariant. So we can start to understand better this flow in the in the space of parameters by linearizing the RG flow around a fixed point. Okay. So we can define
a set of coordinates in parameter space that parameterize your distance from the from the fixed point, and then we can look at the evolution of these quantities. Okay, so we take the derivative of g alpha. This gives us the uh, beta function computed at uh, g alpha, and then take the derivative of g star. Here you are at the fixed point, so you get uh, zero. Okay, so this is beta alpha of g alpha, which we can write as beta alpha of g star plus delta g, and so we can expand this as the derivative of beta alpha with respect to g beta computed at the fixed point times delta g beta plus terms that are delta g squared. Okay. So in the neighborhood of a fixed point, we can linearize the, um, the, RG, the RG flow, okay? And, um, and then we, set, we get a, a set of linear equations. Uh, yes, of course. Everywhere. Okay. And to make things like that. Okay. So this is just a set of linear equations like this. Okay. And you see this matrix L characterizes the fixed point. Okay, so for every fixed point, you're going to have a different matrix L. L star, if you like. So now this is just a, a set of coupled linear equations, and we know how to solve these kind of equations. Okay, so we just go to a basis of eigenvalues of, uh, of L. So in particular, we are going to take left eigenvalues of L. So each eigenvalue EI satisfies <coughs> an eigenvalue equation. Okay, and once we know these eigenvectors of L star, we can define a new set of couplings, which I'm going to call UI. These are EI alpha, G alpha. Okay, you see this is just a change of basis in the space of uh, couplings. And then on this basis, what we obtain is a set of uncoupled equations. Okay? Everybody okay with that? But then this we know how to solve, okay? And um, And then we find the solution is just behaves like a power of uh, the lattice spacing, okay? which we can also rewrite as ui of 1 over m. And I've used 
1 over m to denote an infrared, sort of large distance scale, and a to denote my sort of usual lattice cutoff. Okay? So, you see that now we can actually classify these couplings according to the value of lambda i. Okay? So, if lambda i is positive, then the coupling is called the relevant coupling. And the reason this is called relevant is because when you go to low energies, so when this number be becomes small and the power is positive, this is a small number, and so this coupling tends to grow. Okay? So that's called the relevant coupling. For the very same reason, if lambda i is negative, the coupling is called irrelevant, which means that when you look at physics far away from the cutoff, so when this number is small and this power is negative, then the coupling here goes to zero. Okay. So it really doesn't matter which value you started from. In the infrared, the coupling will always go to zero. So it's called an irrelevant coupling. When lambda is equal to zero, then the coupling is called marginal, which means that this naive linearized analysis doesn't work. You have to go to second order in delta G and you get a logarithmic running, which again can be relevant or irrelevant depending on the sign of the coefficient in front. Okay? So we can kind of sketch the flow in parameter space. We are going to have irrelevant directions. Okay? So this is an irrelevant coupling. You start somewhere at the cutoff scale. And then as you look at the physics at low energies, the irrelevant coupling goes to zero. Okay. There will be relevant couplings that instead grow as you go towards, as you look at the physics at low energies. Remember, the, the RG flow always goes from the ultraviolet to the infrared. And so if you start somewhere in your theory space, and you look at the RG evolution, you're going to have trajectories that go like this. Okay. Now, you see, if you have a relevant coupling, okay, and you want to have a specific value of this relevant coupling at low energies, then you need to fine tune the value at the cutoff scale. Okay? So you need to give a renormalization condition that specifies the value of the relevant couplings at the cutoff scale so that you get the physics that you want at low energies. If you have an irrelevant coupling, you don't care. Okay? It doesn't matter what you put in the, in the action at the cutoff scale, the low energy physics will always be the same because the irrelevant couplings go to zero. So coming back to your question now, okay, you need to specify, so a renormalization scheme is specified by giving a value to all the relevant coupling at a given fixed point. Okay? So you renormalize always in the neighborhood of a given fixed point, and you need to give, the fixed point does not depend on the scheme, it's scheme independent, so if you reparameterize the space, you can always reparameterize the space of couplings, okay, the existence of the fixed point is scheme independent. These eigenvalues are also scheme independent, okay? so the number of relevant 
couplings is also scheme independent. So no matter what scheme you choose, you only need to specify a number of renormalization conditions that fix the value of the, bear, of the relevant bare couplings at the cutoff scale. Okay? So even though in principle this is a very large space of parameters, okay, you only need to worry about the relevant couplings. Does that answer your question? Yeah, and, those, those, and those you have to fix, okay? Okay, I'm not sure what you're referring to, but I mean, the parameters that you need to tune are the ones that are relevant. Okay? And those are scheme independent. By, by the way, this is, this, is the, this is the same as the, as the naturalness problem, right? For the, for the Higgs mass. I mean, the, the Higgs mass is exactly a relevant coupling, okay? Which has a small value at low energies. Okay? Any questions? So, to recap once again, these are the parameters that you put in the action at the cutoff scale. Okay, this is the, the parameter that you have in your lattice action. These numbers here describe the physics at low energy. So if you want a given physics, which is the physics that you observe, so if you want a given physics at low energy, you have to fine tune the relevant couplings and you don't have to worry about the irrelevant ones. Okay? Good. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's try to uh, let's try to, to say the same. I don't know whether this is going to be helpful or confusing, but let's let's do it nonetheless. Okay, so let's try to have a look at an, a simple example, okay, of a, of a flow, and try to see if we can understand this idea of uh, relevant and irrelevant in a slightly different um, wording. Okay. So let's take let's take the following example. And this is so suppose you have a scale of theory. And we are in four dimensions. Okay, so G four, this is the coupling of phi to the fourth, is dimensionless. Okay, and let's assume <clears throat> that we had a coupling, we add a coupling G6. So this is a coupling that would multiply a phi to the sixth uh, sort of operator. Okay, so this one is going to have dimension, mass dimension of minus two. So we can write it as A squared times, again, a dimensionless coupling G hat six. Okay, and and we're going to ignore everything else. Okay, we're just going to think of a theory which has these two parameters here. And so the flow is going to be dictated by two beta functions, okay, beta 4 and beta 6. Now, with a little bit of uh, gymnastics, you can show that you get the following uh, evolution equations. Okay, so a VDA of G4 is equal to minus beta of G4 and G6. I'll tell you 
what is the beta without the hat in a, in a second, okay? And a DBA of G hat six plus two G hat six is equal to minus beta six of G four and G six. Now, beta, so beta alpha without the hat is the derivative with respect to, is the log derivative with respect to A of the dimension full coupling, okay? And uh, there is a relation between, um, between, the, between beta without the hat and beta with the hat, which is the following one, which you can check. So beta hat of g hat divided by g hat is equal to d alpha minus d times d beta alpha of g over g alpha. Okay. This is not so. I mean, this is not so important. It's just uh, you. You can either look at the running of the dimension full coupling or the running of the dimension less couplings and the difference, sorry, here is a plus, is a, is a, it's just this constant term, okay, which, which comes from the, from the explicit, fact, which comes from the explicit factor of A that connects G to G hat, okay. So, you can check uh, these two equations uh, offline, or again, uh, you can you can find the solution in the, uh, you can find the, the details in the in the lecture notes. But the relevant point here is that the solution of these two of this set of, of equation gives you a running, which now is going to be a running in a two-dimensional space. Okay, so G6, G4. Suppose you start somewhere here, you're going to run. Suppose you start somewhere else, so this is A0. Let's start, let's start here at B0. You're also going to run, okay? Suppose that the sort of running time, so you know, the, the change in A is the same, we are going to end up in a slightly different place, okay? So G4 is going to run a little bit more because there is a contribution from G6 into the beta function and so on, yeah? And so what we're going to try to do is that we're going to try to compare these two trajectories, okay? So let's zoom, if you like, onto this uh, area. Okay. And if we zoom into that area, we can, so let me first introduce a little bit of, um, of notation. So let's consider a trajectory here in space, which I'm going to denote by bars, like that, okay? And now I'm going to characterize this other trajectory by looking at the deviation from the original one. Okay, so I'm going to introduce some parameters epsilon, which are ju just gi, g minus gi bar. Okay. So I'm going to introduce this parameter epsilon that describe the distance between these two curves at a given value of a. Okay. So let's focus now around the endpoint uh, there. And then this is going to look like that. So this is the end point of my <coughs> bar trajectory. This is the end point of the other one. So this distance here is epsilon 6, OK? It's the difference between the two trajectories in the G6 direction, 
and this distance here is epsilon 4. Is everybody happy with that? Yeah? Okay, so I want to try to characterize this, this distance action. Okay? So the difference between the end point of this trajectory and the point that is directly above along uh, a different trajectory. So this difference I'm going to call Xi 6, okay? And this Xi 6 in a linearized sort of approximation is going to be this distance here, uh, epsilon, minus the, the difference between these two points, okay? Which I'm going which in a linearized approximation is epsilon 4 times the slope of this line. And the slope of that line is ADDA of G6 divided by ADDA of G4. Okay? Is everybody... Yes, yeah, yeah, so you're, exactly. So you're running from some point and, uh, you know, when, uh, for some value of the cutoff, one trajectory finishes here, the other trajectory finishes there, okay? And here I'm just trying to characterize the distance between these two curves at, say, the end point of the first one, okay? So think about it, uh, offline, but you can see that in a linearized approximation, this is what this distance looks like, okay? So now we can, so now we can write an evolution equation for, for Xi, right? Because Xi is just a combination of epsilon 6, epsilon 4, and some beta functions. So I can take the derivative with respect to A. And again, we're, we're not going to do um, all the algebra. I'm just going to give you the equation and the solution. And the equation is that ADDA of psi plus 2 psi 6. Okay, this comes, of, this comes from the RG equation for epsilon 6. And this is equal to beta 6. 6 bar plus beta 4, 4 bar plus A VDA of log of beta 4 bar. That, that multiplies sine 6. Okay, where beta alpha beta bar means the derivative of beta alpha with respect to G beta computed at G hat bar, okay? Again, something you can check uh, offline. Now, given this uh, equation, we can write the solution, and the solution looks like that. Okay. Xi 6 at m minus 1 is equal to Xi 6 of A times AM squared. This is a direct consequence of this term here in the differential equation. Then we have a ratio of beta functions. So beta 4 at A. So this means that in here you plug the values of g hat bar at this uh, scale and then there's an exponential of the integral from am to 1 dt over t and then beta 6x bar 
plus beta for four bar. Okay, this is not. I mean, the details are not uh, so important, but still, try to try to work out all the all the steps. It's a, it's a good exercise to check that uh, you you understand what is what is going on. I mean, the important feature here. I mean, all this lengthy discussion is to actually end up with this factor here. Okay. So you see, this factor goes to zero when AM becomes small. Okay. So again, remember, AM becomes small is when there is a large separation between the cutoff scale and the scale of the physics that you are uh, interested in, which means that if you look at trajectories, again, in this G4, G6 plane, you know, they will all look like this. So at a given scale, <coughs> the spread of these, uh, of these trajectories goes down like AM squared. Okay. So this really means that you know, it doesn't really matter where you start in the G6. So this is another way of seeing that G6 is, in a, is, is an irrelevant parameter. It doesn't really matter where you start in the G6 plane. You, know, you start somewhere in G4. You evolve up to some point. Okay. And then any other trajectory will be within a distance which scales like AM squared. Okay? So if you start anywhere else in the G4, G6 plane, provided there is a sufficient separation between the cutoff scale and the scale that you're interested in, all the trajectories will be in a range that is of order AM squared. Does that clarify things, or does it make it more obscure? Well, try to do the, try, try to do the, try to fill the missing sort of steps, and then, uh, and then we can have a, I'm, I'm very happy to, to chat about this uh, offline, you know, it's, it's something that does require a little bit of uh, time to, to digest. Okay? <laughs> so basically, again, to summarize, <laughs> You have to fine-tune the relevant operator to be to have the to have the low energy physics that you want, okay? and you don't care about the irrelevant ones. So you have to fine-tune you have to fine-tune the value of G4 at the cutoff to ensure that your trajectory ends up here. But then all the other trajectories will pass in an interval, which is of order AM squared. Okay? So, so if you're sufficiently away from the cutoff and you tune your relevant parameters, then you get the physics that you want in the in the ultra in the in the, in the infrared. So, in the in in the continuum limit. Okay. So when you when you look at physics, which is at a scale which is far away from the cutoff scale. Now, can we actually describe the way we approach this continuum limit? Well, the answer is the answer is yes. And the answer has been known for a, for a very for a very long time, okay, and this, this, we're now going back to these ideas of effective field theories that I was discussing um, yesterday. Okay. So these ideas were all developed by Simanzi in the sort of late late seventies, early eighties, okay, and uh, and they were beautifully summarized by a single sentence in a review by Giorgiai. Giorgiai didn't do any, any work on, on lattice field theory, but he's, he's got this review 
goes back to 93. And then where he says that, you know, after all, the cutoff is just a type of new physics. Okay, at um, at short distance, at high energies. Okay. So the idea is that you know whatever you do when you introduce a regularization, you introduce a scale, which is your sort of high energy scale, and at that energy, you are modifying the theory so that you get rid of the so that you get rid of the divergences one one way or another okay so the basic idea and this is really the, the this really goes back to to semantic even though you know the semantic papers are written in a language that is kind of hostile um, it's precisely that that you know the cutoff is just is just a, a modification of the high energy behavior of the theory and the low energy behavior should be described by an effective field theory. Right? The low energy behavior of the theory with a cutoff can be described by uh, an effective field theory just in the same way as you describe uh, new physics. Okay? So, so, the effect, so the idea is that the effect of the regularization can be described by a local effective Lagrangian. This means that you write all the interactions compatible with the symmetry of the high energy theory. Sorry. Okay. So in this case, your high energy theory is your lattice theory. Okay. So the idea is that the lattice theory, so all the, all the cutoff effects can be described by an effective Lagrangian, so a continuum theory, where you add all the possible operators of higher dimensions that have the same uh, sort of symmetries as the, as the, as the lattice theory. Okay? So, again, the operators are going to be classified by their uh, dimension. Okay? So, operators of dimension k plus 4 appear have couplings of that have dimensions a to the power k, okay, and therefore will give us contributions that are uh, of order uh, p a to the power k or mu a to the power k. Where P and mu are your sort of low energy, low energy scales. Okay. So we. So first of all, a couple of uh, comments. Okay. So when you when you look at uh, effective field theories, what you're interested in is the sort of accuracy of your theory. Okay. So the accuracy of your theory is given by this uh, sort of uh, power of k. Here. So you see, if you have a separation between the low energy scale, which is of one order of magnitude, and you include terms up to k equal 2, okay, this is not a huge effort, your description is already an accuracy which is of the order of the percent. Okay? So that's the first uh, comment. The second comment is that we already saw an example of this uh, yesterday in the free theory, okay, 
So when we computed the free, the free field propagator, we found that in the limit where PA is small, we got this Lorentz breaking P mu to the fourth contribution, okay, which, could, which, was, which could have been generated in a, in a continuum theory by adding a higher order operator, which is Lorentz breaking. Okay? Here, remember that this is the sum over mu of d mu to the fourth. Okay? This is not p squared. This is not p squared squared. This is not a Laplacian squared. Okay? So this breaks Lorentz. So in order to reproduce the <laughs> order A corrections to the free propagator, we, we, we already saw that we need to add a term which breaks Lorentz, right? Okay. So now we're going to do this uh, in the general case. So we're going to consider the interacting theory, not the free theory. And then, so on one hand, on the lattice, we're going to have a discretized theory. And then I'm going to reparameterize this m squared in the following way. Okay. I'm going to parameterize m squared with this quantity delta, delta m squared, which is the distance from the critical mass the, and the critical mass is the value of the bare mass such that the renormalized mass in the theory vanishes. Okay? Let's not, I mean, we're not going to get into the, the, the details of that, but you can always define a, a critical mass as a function of the coupling such that some renormalized uh, mass goes to zero. And instead of parameterizing my lattice Lagrangian with m squared, for a given g, I'm just going to parameterize my bare Lagrangian with the distance from the critical, from the critical mass. Okay? So given this uh, theory, we can actually compute, uh, for instance, 1pi uh, correlators. Okay? So I'm going to denote like this. So they will depend on g, on delta m squared and on A, okay, and in general, there will be a factor of A to some power, which just takes into account the naive dimensions of the <laughs> correlator, and then we will have an expansion in powers of A, okay, and then at each order in A, we have an expansion, for instance, if we do a perturbative calculation in logs of A to the power K times some coefficient, which I'm going to call FKG. Okay. And you know, if, we, if you do a perturbative calculation, graphs, diagrams with L loops contribute to K smaller or equal than L. Okay, so graph diagrams with L loops produce powers of log A up to the number of loops. Okay. Now, because we want to match to uh, the lattice theory to a continuum theory, we can actually, and we're only going to think uh, in perturbative, in perturbation theory for the, for, for the purpose of this, we can always consider the <coughs> lattice theory defined in an arbitrary number of dimensions. Okay, so we're going to move away from the equal four 
and then we can rewrite this expansion in the following form. If you go to four plus epsilon dimensions, this just becomes a sum over j and k of a sorry, of j minus epsilon k, so the logs transform into powers of a of f j k. Okay? So in a generic number of dimensions, you can compute the correlators in your uh, lattice theory, and they look like that. Okay? That's the lattice theory with a cutoff in place. This, this thing here. Yeah. This is the this is thing. You can compute any. You can compute any correlator in perturbation theory. It will be. Okay. And you can always expand in powers of a. And you can look at the coefficients of that expansion. The coefficients of that expansion will look like powers of log times coefficients. Okay. The most stupid example is the free correlator that we did yesterday, right? where the lowest order was p squared. So this would have been the term with j equal to 0, plus we saw a correction that was of order a squared. Okay? This is true in general. For any correlator, you can expand like that. Yeah, exactly. All the, all the non-trivial terms here come from, if you do it in perturbation theory, come from, they come from loops. I'm not renormalizing here. Okay. I'm just parameterizing the bare mass in terms of the distance from the critical mass. Okay, these are all still bare parameters. Okay, this is a this is a theory with a cutoff in place with bare parameters. Yeah. So it, yeah, it, you're right. It looks like a renormalization, but it's not. Okay. So this is a bare parameter. Uh, this is also a bare parameter, if you like, which is a function of g. Okay, so instead of parameterizing my theory in terms of m squared, I parameterize my theory in terms of the distance from m0. Okay. okay, very good. So let's. So this is my lattice side of the, of the world. And now, as I said, I want to describe this theory by a continuum. Local effective Lagrangian. Okay. So, this effective Lagrangian, I can classify the operators in terms of their naive dimension. Okay. <coughs> so I will look like that. So, there will be operators of dimension 4. And then there will be higher order operators, well, four and four and below. Okay. And then there will be operators of dimension six that appear with a, an a squared factor in front. There will be operators of dimension eight, which appear with a factor of a to the fourth in front, and so on. Okay. So for the first few two terms, we can actually sit down and. Uh, just count, classify all the possible operators. And the possible operators are going to be the following one. So there is a, a kinetic term, d mu d mu. There is a mass term, which I'm going to write like that. There is a coupling, there is a four point coupling which I'm going to write like this. And then at order, and then, the, and then there is nothing else, right? These are the only dimension four operators that we can write that are uh, invariant under the hypercubic group and uh, under this Z2 symmetry. And then there are operators of order A squared. Now I'm going to write uh, all of them 
okay so there is a there is this d mu to the fourth operator that we were mentioning yesterday and then there are a few more so there is a z phi box squared phi three factorial z6 times g times phi cubed phi uh, box phi then there is a 1 over 6 factorial z7 times g squared times phi to the sixth then there is a 1 half Z8 delta m squared phi box phi and then there is a minus 1 over 4 sorry for the long list but it's nice to see them all Z9 delta m squared g phi to the fourth and finally is a one half z10 delta m to the fourth times phi squared plus order a to the fourth okay so this is the full list you can uh, sit down offline and uh, check that uh, you cannot think of anything else so let's have a look at uh, all these terms and let's try and let's discuss uh, a little bit how we're going to, to use them. Okay, so this is dimension four. This is a local effective Lagrangian, so every term in the Lagrangian comes with its own coupling, if you like. Okay, so there is a coupling in front of the kinetic term, which you can, I mean, you can call it a coupling or you can call it the normalization of the fields in the effective Lagrangian, which I'm going to call Z3. There's a, there's a mass term in front of the phi square term, which I'm going to call Z2 delta m squared. There is a four-point coupling. And then that's all you have at dimension four. Okay. So you see, these are all the terms that are invariant under the hypercubic symmetry of the lattice of dimension 4. It happens that they're also Lorentz invariant. This was not a requirement. Okay? We wrote all the possible terms that are invariant under the hypercubic symmetry of dimension 4. These are the terms and they're all Lorentz invariant. So you see that the breaking of the Lorentz symmetry, which is built in, if you like, in the lattice formulation, because the moment we discretize space-time, we are breaking Lorentz down to the hypercubic subgroup, only comes from irrelevant operators. Okay? And this is why Yesterday, we found, when we looked at the free propagator, we found that the corrections were, that the, the Lorentz breaking terms were all in the order a square correction. This is true in general. This is not just a property of the free theory. This is a property of the scalar field theory in general. And, you, and we will see, actually, of uh, all other lattice theories. The Lorentz breaking is always due to irrelevant operators. So in the language that we introduced a moment ago, these higher dimensional operators are irrelevant operators. Okay. And the breaking comes entirely from irrelevant operators. So you're guaranteed that if you take the continuum limit, so if you look at the physics at a scale which is far away from the cutoff scale, you're guaranteed that the Lorentz breaking is going to be uh, an order, a lattice artifact, if you like. So it's going to be suppressed by powers of A. Okay. Now, these terms are all the terms that you can write of dimension 6, okay? 
including redefinition of the fields and everything. I mean, you can sit down and think about this for a, for a while. Um, you see, every term comes with its own coupling, okay? And there's only one term here that breaks Lorentz invariance. Okay. So if you go back to Lorentz symmetry, all the breaking comes from this term here. Everything else in, is Lorentz invariant. Okay. And now the the claim okay, is that um, if you tune properly all these couplings, so in this case there are 10 of them, then your continuum theory is going to reproduce your lattice theory up to terms that are, that are of, I mean, up and including all the effects of order A squared. Okay? So, you need to fix these couplings. In order to fix these couplings, you have to do what you always do with effective field theories. You have to give matching conditions. Okay? So you have to give, in this case, 10 matching conditions that fix these couplings here in such a way that your, um, that your continuum effective field theory reproduces the uh, lattice results, okay? Does that make sense? Yes? So in this particular example, there is a, so you can choose any, any condition you like, okay? You just have to match, you just have to match, uh, let's say, 1PI functions in the two, in the two theories, okay? So in, uh, if, you, if you look at the, the scalar field theory in, uh, in perturbation theory, um, a useful, a useful, um, useful conditions can be imposed for p equals zero, delta n square equals zero. Okay. So, if you set all the external momenta to zero and the renormalized mass to zero, then if you work in dimensional regularization in the continuum. In the, in the continuum theory, the only contributions that you get are uh, Born contributions, are three-level contributions, okay? Because all the loops are going to vanish in uh, dimensional regularization. So if you compute the, um, any correlator in the, in the effective field theory, in... Uh, in the effective field theory, they are going to be given by their three-level contribution. So, for instance, if you look at a four-point function, you set all the momenta to zero. You choose some value of g. You set delta m squared to zero. You compute in dim reg with a cutoff A. This is the lattice. This is the correlator in the lattice theory. In the effective field theory, this is going to be equal to Z1 times G. Okay. So you compute this four-point function at P equals zero on the lattice for a given value of G, and that fixes Z1. Okay. Then you do the same for... Uh, for um, for Z2, okay, so for Z2 you can consider a two-point function with a phi-squared insertion. You set all the momenta to zero. You set the momentum of the insertion to zero. You compute a G, zero, epsilon, and A. And now this in the, in the effective theory gives you exactly Z2. 
So this is an object that looks like this. The external legs, fp equal to zero. This is a phi squared insertion. Okay. So you compute this correlator in the effective theory, you get z2. You compute the corresponding correlator on the lattice, you get some number. That number fixes z2. And so on. Okay, you can do this for uh, for uh, for every coupling that appears in the in the effective Lagrangian. I'm not going to write them. I'm not going to write them all. Um, just I mean just to give you one more example. You can set. Uh, for instance, you can compute a six-point function where you set all the momenta to zero, coupling to G, del time to zero, epsilon, and A on the lattice, and this is going to give you uh, G squared, Z7. Okay, again. So one, two, three, four, five, six point function where p is equal to zero. Okay? So one by one for each coupling, you set a renormalization condition and that oh sorry, you set a matching condition and that allows you to compute the, the coefficients. Once you have computed all the coefficients, you have a predictive tool to describe your lattice artifacts. Okay? So your lattice theory up to order a to the fourth is going to be described by this continuum Lagrangian. Okay? So you see that the low energy limit will be given by the continuum theory and then there will be and then you have a quantitative way of predicting the order a squared corrections. Okay. So this is the generalization of the simple example that we saw yesterday to the case of the interacting theory. So the principle is very simple. Right? So at low energies, your theory is going to be um, described by an effective Lagrangian. So as some of you were saying yesterday, you can actually predict the behavior of this A squared corrections just by counting operators. Okay? The difficult part is to determine the couplings that give you the correct description of the lattice theory. In order to compute these couplings, you have to impose matching conditions, which means that you have to be able to compute some correlators both in the lattice theory and in the local effective Lagrangian. Once you have computed these couplings, you can predict <laughs> the lattice artifacts, so the, if you like, the order A corrections of your lattice theory up to, up to and including order A squared. Okay? Now, this is useful in, in two ways. I mean, first of all, it gives you a, a way of uh, computing the, the artifacts. Um, although, I mean, in a very expensive way. The, the way it's really used in, in lattice simulation is that you, know, you can do something. And this goes back to your question, Fabio, so you can stop checking email. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. <laughs> you can actually add irrelevant operators to the lattice action itself. Right? So what happens if you add an irrelevant operator in the lattice action? What do you expect? I mean, an irrelevant operator in the lattice action is just yet another modification of the high energy physics, right? Yeah? So you will still have a description in terms of a local effective Lagrangian, but the coefficients of the, in the local effective Lagrangian will change. Yeah? Does that make sense? 
So then you can add irrelevant operators to the lattice theory, and you can tune the coefficients in the lattice theory in such a way that you cancel some of the order A corrections, or possibly all, sorry, order A squared correction, or possibly all of the order A squared correction. If you can do that, then the lattice theory is called an improved theory. It's called an improved theory because the corrections will start at a higher order in A. Okay? Now, for the case of the scalar field theory, this is complicated because there are a lot of dimension six operator. But when we, when we go to, to a gauge theory, this is actually much easier because there's only one operator to tune in order to get rid of the order A corrections. Okay, when we go to a gauge theory, we, we will see that in some cases, the leading corrections are order A, and there is only one, and, and then you do exactly the same analysis. You just write down all the operators that are gauge invariant, okay, and symmetric under the hypercubic symmetry. In that case, you find that there is only one, one operator of dimension five. So all the order A artifacts are controlled just by one operator. So by adding just one operator, you can remove the leading corrections in the case of uh, gauge theories. And again, these are called improved improved actions. So these are actions where the convergence to the continuum limit is faster. Okay? So if you think of the continuum limit in terms of a separation between the cutoff scale and the low energy scale, if you have an improved theory, you can get away with a smaller separation between the cutoff and, uh, and, the, low energy, and the low energy physics that you are uh, interested in. Okay? Does that uh, make sense? Okay, so I'm going to stop here. Um, tomorrow we're going to look at Fermi. We will come back to this, uh, to, to, ev I mean, to everything I said uh, today. We will come back to, to this and see how it's actually applied in practice in order to study, say, the Q say QCD, okay, starting from a, from a lattice formulation. But before we do that, we need to discuss fermions and gauge fields. So tomorrow we'll try to discuss fermions and gauge fields uh, briefly. And then on, uh, on Thursday, we will, uh, we will look at QCD, and I want to discuss the, the determination of alpha strong on, on Thursday. Okay? So think about this. I mean, this, this, is a lot of, uh, you know, this is a lot of material condensed into a very short amount of time. So if you have any questions, don't, don't hesitate. I mean, I will be, I will be around all, uh, all day, okay? Any instant question before we break for coffee? No, we're all, we're all exhausted. That's fine. Let's, let's go for coffee. <laughs>